Right, uh, so today we're going to move on, sort of following on from what I talked about on Monday about estimation and how as ecologists we can evaluate the precision of the sample that we take. In this lecture we're going to move on a bit on that and sort of say, okay, well if we want to... If we want to compare between two things that we're interested in, how do we do that? We've talked about how to make a measurement, how many fish are in the lake, how many gill rakers does a stickleback have. But what if we want to make an actual comparison and have some certainty, some confidence in our, in our estimate of that comparison? How do we know that there's more fish in this lake than that lake? How do we know that one ecotype of stickleback has more gill rakers than another ecotype? And as you can see, to do this, we use pretty much all the same things, all the same characteristics that we talked about when doing a when making an estimate in the in the previous lecture. Now I know it's only the end of the previous lecture. Some of the things we talked about were a little bit abstract and a little bit unclear. And some people came and we had a chat afterwards and did, went through a worked example. That is brilliant feedback for me. Okay, if there's something that you don't understand in a lecture, if you're happy to put up your hand and ask me. If you're not happy to come up and talk to me afterwards or arrange a time to come in and meet me. If I don't get that feedback, I don't know that you need more guidance, I don't know that what I'm saying isn't getting through, okay? So, people who did come and talk to me, thanks for doing that. As a, as a result of that, I added a little worksheet into D2L with a worked example of how to do the calculations that I was talking about in the class. Because, because this is important and because these same calculations or very similar calculations are used for when we do an estimate of the, the strength of our comparisons. I'm going to run through one of those worked examples now. And I'm going to take this same worked example and we're sort of going to follow with it and run through it for the rest of the class. So what we talked about on Monday was really getting the, the characteristics of our sample. As, a, as an ecologist, as a scientist, as an ecologist, we're interested in the overall population. We're interested in what, how many gill rakers do all the stickleback of a particular type of a particular ecotype have. But we can't sample all of them. So we take a sample and we do some assessment on our sample. We use a correct experimental design to make sure our sample is a a thorough representation, a good reflection of the distribution, the full distribution in the population. Then we need to measure the spread of data in the sample. And by incorporating sample size, we can estimate this standard error. And that allows us to get a confidence interval on the sample. So we can say with some degree of certainty, with 95% confidence, that the mean value for this sample will fall between our, our mean minus standard, standard error and our mean plus standard error. So let's work through the example we're going to take for this is the tree spine stickleback. In this example we've talked about in the evolutionary ecology lectures and various different forms. And imagine you are an ecologist. You've done your degree, you're out in the real world, either doing a graduate research project or working, work, working in a system. And you're asked to evaluate the sticklebacks within the lake or some trait of a, or a particular fish within the lake. And you know from the work that you've done here and from what you've learned that we can have different ecotypes within a lake associated with different habitats. And this is re really important because if we're interested in the conservation, we need to be able to make sure that our conservation strategies are, are working for both different types of morphs or different ecotypes. So what do we do? 
we've got a question. Do limnetic and benthic ecotypes of three fine stickleback have different amounts of gill rakers? If we want to answer that question, the first thing we need to say is how many gill rakers do limnetic and benthic ecotypes have? Before we can look at the comparison, we need to do an estimation. So we go and we take a sample. Give me some ideas. How do we get a sample? How do we get a representative sample from, from this lake? What type of things would we do? Gill net, yeah, so we talked about that. We can put out a gill net with a set mesh size. We have to make sure, could we just put the nets at random in the lake? No, where, where would we need to put nets? Not at random, so it's, <coughs> yeah, yeah. So we need to make sure that we've got, we're looking at a pelagic form, a linetic form, and a benthic form. So we want to make sure that we have a sampling strategy that is equally likely to pick up both. If we just sample in the, the open water, and we don't get any linetic form or any benthic forms, we're getting an inaccurate sample. No? We're getting a good sample but it's only representative of what we're doing. It's not representative of what's in the lake. If we're using a gill net, we need to make sure that we have different sized meshes. If we're using, if we're doing a complete, completely different environment, if we're looking at capturing birds, we want to use mist nets. We have to use mist nets. Similar, similar characteristics to gill nets, we have to have them in the correct habitat. If we're doing invertebrates, we'd have to have different types of traps in the correct habitats. We'd need to match our, our, our sampling strategy to, to the question. And then we've collected our sample. We're happy with the sampling strategy. And we want to know, essentially, what we want to say is within this population, are there two distinct distributions of this trait. So in a typical fish, if there's no, if they haven't split into these different ecotypes, gill rakers should have this sort of uniform modal distribution. If they are different, if they have split, we'll have to sample the limetic form and the benthic form, assess their distributions independently, and then say, how confident, how convinced are we that these are two separate distributions? Or could they, just by chance, be two separate samples from one single distribution? So to do that, to measure this distribution, we need to use the values that we talked about earlier, when I'm talking in the previous lesson. And we need four. <laughs> We need four specific pieces of information. We need to know the sample size. How many samples, how many fish did we take? The sample mean, represented by this X bar here. What's the mean number, the average number of gill rakers for the limetic form and for the benthic form? The standard deviation. What's the distribution? What's the spread in these numbers? How wide are the, is that distribution? And once we know those three things, we can calculate the standard error. And then we, with the standard error, we can estimate our confidence, 95% confidence, around our calculation of the mean. How confident are we that that mean value we come up with, we've come up with, is an accurate value for that for that for that sample? So I've done a work through and it's in D2L. What I'm going to do right now is, don't, if anybody has a laptop, but if you have a laptop and you have it all ready and ready to go, please, by all means, open it up. But don't everybody pull out a laptop and try and log into D2L now. Instead, we'll load up again. You, okay. So for that distribution of data. So 
is again sort of just a different type, different representation of that's a, this is a different program, different representation of that dummy data that's in the the worksheet. N is 30, X bar is 15, standard deviation of 2, standard error of 0 0.4. So the true mean is 95% likely to lie between X bar plus or minus two standard errors. So it's plus <coughs> minus plus or minus 0 0.8. So we are 95% certain that for this sample, the mean is between 14.2 and 15.8. Hmm? That's, we'll, we'll see in a little while why we use 95 and why we, it's, it's quite arbitrary. Okay, when we get to the end, we're going to talk a little bit about p-values and what, what we mean by a p-value and why, what's significant about a p-value of 0 0.05? Yep, yeah, yeah. So we sort of take this p-value of 0 0.05 as meaning it's a, it's a, it's a trend, it's a, a difference that we're, that's credible, that we believe. We're 95% sure that this degree of difference couldn't arise by chance. We could take a p-value of 0 0.01, and then we're 99% certain that this degree of difference couldn't arise by chance. Why is it here 0 0.8? Because it's plus or minus two standard errors. Okay? Yeah, so we calculate standard error 0 0.4, and it's plus or minus 95 confidence for a set confidence interval is plus or minus two standard error. The mathematics behind it is beyond what we need to worry about for this course. The detailed mathematics behind it is even beyond what I need to worry about. So for the moment, this is how we can calculate 95% 95% of the time. If we take a sample, take this sample 100 times, 95 times the mean value will lie between 14.2 and 15.8. That's what that calculation is telling. That's our estimation. That allows us, that to, allows us to estimate the distribution of the range of gill rakers in one of these forms. For this, we did it on the, on the basic form. And we found that between 14 and 16, between 14.2 and 15.8 gill ratios, and we can look at the data, and that looks around about right. So let's say you went to this lake, you took your sample, and you didn't get a nice distribution. You didn't get a nice, lovely, unimodal, normal distribution. <coughs> you got something like this. It's two or three different peaks in it. It's, there's something, there's something not right in that data. This is for pool for all the signal back together, and this here is we just split them by color. I just said okay, plot, plot out the benthic type and the limetic type separately. And when we do that, you can see that this noisy sort of distribution can be re turns into just by magic two separate distributions. All, all I've done is I've just, been, I've just split those and presented them as two, da two data series as opposed to just one combined. We can look at that and say, yeah, it certainly looks like the, the benthic form and the linetic form have two have different <coughs> numbers of gear rates. But how confident are you in that? Are you... 95% certain? Are you 99% certain? Are you 90% certain? And this has become very important if you have to go back to a management company or to a government body who are talking about doing some habitat, changing the habitat in this lake. You say, well, I'm, I think there's a really interesting 
evolutionary phenomenon going on in this lake, and I'm around about 40% sure. It's not very convincing. But if you can go and say, well, I'm 99% certain, you've got more strength in your convictions. And this is where statistics, where, where we can use statistics to bring our, our understanding from the sort of descriptive science to something that's more quantitative. In this case, we're going to talk, there's a whole variety of different tests we could use, a whole variety of different ways that we can analyze data. And as you go on in subsequent courses, you're going to learn a lot more about different tests and how, what, what they're telling you, what they're testing, what assumptions they make, how they work. But today, we just want to introduce the basic concept behind how, excuse me, what a, what a simple statistical analysis is doing. We're going to work with one of the, the simplest tests, but they all essentially work the same way. Today we're going to go through a t-test, a student t-test, for comparing two means. So remember, what we wanted to, what we were looking at here was the mean of population one, which we did for the benthics, and our confidence interval around it. So we're 95% certain that this population has between 14.2 and 15.8 kilo radius. How certain are we that these two are different? We can calculate this using the using the t-test. First thing we need to do in this test, and essentially in all statistical tests, is Measure the pattern. Measure how different these two populations are. And then we want to ask ourselves, is this pattern, is this degree of difference strong enough for us to believe? Or could it be something that just arrives out of chance? And there's three, when we think about patterns, we're like humans are In some ways very good, and in some ways very bad at identifying patterns. We see patterns in everything. Whether the patterns there or not, we can identify this and say, yes, I, I, I wore my blue underpants today, and I scored three goals when I was playing soccer. Therefore, my blue underpants allow me to score more goals playing soccer. Not necessarily true. What makes these patterns more or less convincing is when we start to add some data to it and makes these more or less believable. So we can intuitively make some assumptions or make some interpretations of patterns. Here we've got two distributions of data. The mean of this one is 77, the mean of this one is 87. Here the mean is 50, and here the mean is 100. We're more confident that so this pattern, that these two things are different, is intuitively more convincing. No? These are more likely to be different than these here. Similarly, the standard deviation, the spread in the data. Intuitively, we can say that this allows us, this informs our <coughs> confidence around the pattern. Here we've got two samples. They have the same mean. Oh, sorry, they have these two samples here, let's say this value up here also has a mean of 77. This value here is a mean of 87. The standard deviation on both of these is 7. So means are, are considered are distinct, but the range, the spread of values is quite large. If we take a certain different set of samples, here the mean can be the same, or can be, and can be the same as here. So the mean of this is 77 mean of this is 87, but the ranges are much far tighter. The standard deviation is much smaller. Again, are these, which is a more convincing pattern, that blue lines and that blues and reds are different? I'd certainly argue that this is more convincing than that, because our values are more precise. This 
So we're, we want to be convinced that they're different, that blue and red are different. Yeah? So you take, let's say we've done an assessment on sticklebacks, yeah? And I measured 30 sticklebacks and found that one population has gill rakers, like 77 gill rakers, and another has 87 gill rakers. Or if I measured them and said that one population had 50, and the other had a hundred. Which of the, in which case would you be more convinced that the red population has more gill rakers than the blue population? Yeah? So, so, so the, the difference in the mean is important or is intuitively important. The standard deviation, the spread in the data is also intuitively important. And the sample size is intuitively <laughs> important. If I got this distribution from 25 samples, or from 25,000 samples. Are we going to have to know how to calculate it, or do you just want to know the purpose of calculating it? Hmm? Like, to get the value, are we actually going to need to apply that and find out what the answers are, or do you just want to look at it and understand what they mean? In life or in this test? In the course. For the course? Why, why are you doing the course? Makes it more fun. Sorry? I guess take both of it. Just take both. Right. Can you say that again? Sorry. Never mind. Okay. You're in. Okay. For a broader point, you can come to university to get a degree, or you can come to university to learn. You can, or hopefully, you can do both. I will. There'll be a way that you're tested in this in the on this data or on the, the material. You've sort of done a little bit on that. I get some sample questions earlier on. But also, you're going to leave the next four years, three years from now, with a whole new set of knowledge and information that you can take and apply in your jobs and life from here on out. I can speak from experience. This is a one year, have a wonderful opportunity to make the most of that freedom and that time because I can guarantee you you're not going to have it after four years. For the test, for the, the purposes of this course, you won't, you won't need, certainly in the last three years that I've taught this, you won't need a calculator to, do, to sit the final exam. You will need to understand the traits that we're talking about. You will need to understand the concepts that we're talking about. Rather than, so we've talked about the actual the, the numbers and the characteristics of these spreads of data volumes. If we want to measure that pattern, if we want to say how certain am I, how convinced am I by the difference in that pattern, essentially what we can what we do is we take these three traits, the difference in the mean, difference in the spread of the standard deviation, and the sample size, we fit them into a formula. And that formula, for, for, for this is the formula for the, for the t-test, that formula allows us to measure the strength of this pattern. So essentially what we're doing here, this, this is the formula, gives us t, t equals the strength in the pattern, t is how different these two sets of numbers are. And the, what it is, how it's cal calculated, it's the difference in the means divided by the square root, so this is the mean of sample one minus the mean of sample two. Those bars mean we take an absolute number. We're not interested in whether it's negative or positive. We're interested in how different those two means are. Divided by the, we probably have, we've got square roots and things. Don't worry about that too much for now. That's divided by standard deviation, in turn divided by the sample size. What we've done is we've taken those three intuitive traits and put them into a formula. And we can use that formula to identify how strong the, path, the difference in patterns is. How strong is the difference between two different populations. Let's run with our stickleback example. We went and we took samples from pelagic nets of the netic forms, from benthic nets of benthic forms. We measure the gill rate, the number of gill rates in each of those. 
took around about 30 samples, 30, 30 fish altogether. We can look, we can, that's the count, so benthic, one, that's 30 fish, 15, 16, 14, 15, whatever, 21, 19, 18, 20, 22. You can see here that we've got two different distributions, benthic and the net. We can now have data. We've got some numbers that we can plug into our into our t-test formula. The mean values for benthic. So let's say we're working on the formula. Let's say the benthics are one, the mimetics are two. Just to add into uh, the match up with the um, <coughs> numerics in the formula. The mean is fifteen for benthic, for the mimetics almost twenty. Standard deviation, 2.6, 2.5, and 30 for both. Plug that in, we get a T value of 7.2. That's telling us that the degree of difference between these two is 7.2. In a little while, we sort of talk about exactly what that means. Okay, back in the middle. Okay, so this, we, can, we know how to measure the pattern. We know how to measure how different these two series of numbers are. What does that mean? So what? We've got a value of 7.2, or we had a value when we changed the sample, the, the mean, so 2.1. We changed the sample size, our T value changed to 1.8. What? So what? What's the significance of that degree of difference? To understand that, and to interpret that, we need to go back and calculate the p-value for that statistic, for, for that t-value. Our p-value, the p-value is simply the probability, so probability between 0 and 1, that the apparent pattern, that an apparent pattern, as strong or stronger than that observed, arising by chance, if there was no real pattern. So the apparent pattern is comes from the difference between our samples. The real pattern is the difference between population. <coughs> so essentially what we're saying is if I took two samples. What's the chances? How convinced am I that these two samples are different? That these two values are different? By chance, there's always an opportunity. Even if we had a normal distribution of data, and I took two random samples out of that, there's always a possibility that they could be statistically different. What we're doing with the p-value is saying, based on all the information that we've already given it, the information that we've put in to calculate the t-score, what's the probability that these two things are different? If the p-value is very large, then the pattern we observe is pretty likely to occur by chance. So there's no evidence for a real pattern. If the p-value is very small, then the pattern we observe is very unlikely to occur by chance. So this is evidence for a real pattern. We can work through a, or you know, time at least you can work through an example of this using using the data we've given. It's how small so how small should P V B V P be before we believe our pattern? This varies. This is where we get to 0 0.05 being statistically <coughs> significant. In some instances, or some fields, P must be 0 0.01 before it's classed as being statistically significant. When you're dealing with ecology and very noisy data, getting P point at 0 0.05 happens quite rarely. So we need to be able to 
find other ways of estimating our influence or our, our certainty. There's a school of thought at the moment coming through that wants to completely do away with the p-values because this number, people have a, a fascination with it, that we have to get to p0.05. But in reality, it's just an arbitrary value that people picked and then decided, yes, 95% confidence. That, sound, that sounds convincing to me. But is 0 0.06 that much different to 0? If you're 94% certain of something, is that much different to being 95% certain of something? If you're 92%, if you're 90%, what point do, do you decide that you're, that you're confident in the trick? If you were, don't think of it in terms of want, you're describing data, yeah? If, if we looked at these two different traits for using the Gilroy, for example, yeah? And saw that when we calculated the t value, we got a p value that was 0 0.04, or 0 0.4 then that's telling us that based on, and as you'll see in a moment, degrees of freedom, but based on the degree of difference between these two populations and the type of experiment you did, there's no reliable evidence that, or based on the data, you can't be convinced, or you shouldn't be convinced, that these two different populations have different numbers of gill rates, or these two ecotypes have different numbers of gill rates. To calculate, I just mentioned these degrees of freedom, when we want to calculate p-value, essentially what we're doing, we use statistical tables. In the olden days, it came in a little book. Now they're stored in statistical software, so you don't actually need to look them up. But it's just a computer automatically doing the same thing for you. And this is how we get the p-value. We need two pieces of information. You need a, a t-score, which is the degree, remember that's the, the degree of difference between the two data sets, and degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom are essentially related to the complexity of the experiment. How many different factors were you testing? How many samples? To some extent related to sample size, how we get time. What about our data? Okay. For our gill record data, for now, you can take my word at that degree of freedom is of course three, and our t value is 7.2. So we can go to a table, a t statistic table, follow down three degrees of freedom, follow look for our p our t value, which was 7.2. We've got a p value of 0. Point, around about 0 0.08 or 0 0.008, which means we are over 99% confident that based on the, the data that we have, that those two populations are different. That those two samples were not, could, couldn't arise by chance. That I couldn't have just taken two random samples out of a normal distribution and got those values. We use the, Calculating degrees of freedom is quite complicated, and we don't you don't you don't need to know the details on it for now. But adventurous, essentially, by making assumptions about our data, by making assumptions that our data follows a normal distribution, we can use these statistical tables to simplify our our analysis, to simplify our statistics. In some instances. Our data don't form or follow a normal distribution. Our data are skewed, and we still want to be able to understand or make inferences about the, the data based on what we have. There's a whole suite. There are courses and courses and fields and fields of statistics on how to analyze these types of data, how to handle these types of data. And as ecologists, this is the type of thing that you will get used to and that you spend a lot of time dealing with because ecologists don't have pretty data. We've got narrowly noisy, miserable data. But these are things that you will use to 
try and normalize your data, but to deal with the sort of various noise within, within the data. Okay, quick recap. What we're doing is we want to measure, so in, in statistics, we want to measure the degree of the pattern in our data and then say how convinced are we by this pattern that it's true, that it's real. We set a statistic, we calculate or we decide what test we want to use, we calculate the T, in this case the T statistic, Z score, whatever analysis you're doing will have its own statistic. Calculate the, the test statistic, which is an estimation of the degree of difference within the data. And then determine the p value based on that test statistic and the type of experiment you did. Using this, it allows us to validate or verify what we see as a pattern trend. We looked at this and visually you could say, yeah, I'm really certain they're, certain. they're, they're different. But in some instances, they may be closer together. In some instances, you may be missing some samples. And you still, you can use statistics to try and say, how confident am I that these two things are different? Okay, that's all we're gonna say about statistics in the course. Those worksheets are in DQL, so take them, use them, and come and talk to me if you've got questions. All right, enjoy the rest of your day.